Welcome to the Funny Because It's True podcast. I'm your host, Kevin McGeehan. The show is recorded live every other Tuesday at 10 p.m. at the Second City Hollywood in Los Angeles, California. Storytellers are either predetermined or chosen randomly on the night of the show to tell a true story based on different themes. And this podcast is a mixed bag of some of my favorites. The theme of this episode is college. That magical and expensive place where anything can happen. Josh Willis finds the girl of his dreams. John Grady meets a prophetic magician. And I secretly date one of my professors with her ex-boyfriend doing anything he can to stop it. But let's not dawdle. First up, NASA scientist and frequent contributor to the show, Josh Willis. This is the story of how um, I almost let the girl of my dreams slip through my fingers. Uh, oh, thank you, thank you. Um, and it happened in college. Uh, I went to college at the University of Houston, go Cougars. That's what, that's what we used to do, actually. It was uh, you put your thumb and your ring finger together, and they called it the cougar paw, which, I don't know, to me, that sounds like a, sounds like a character from Desperate Housewives or something. Um, but anyway, uh, it started one, like the first week of college. I, I was at this place called Coog's Cafe, and Coog's Cafe, <laughs> not making this up, was this greasy little spoon, and um, I got, a, uh, I, I, I got a, a cheeseburger and some curly fries, and I was walking back to the dorm, and I was feeling it, man. I, I was just hurting. I was so full. And around the corner, uh, a whole group of about a dozen people showed up, and I knew one of them, exactly one. His name was AJ. And AJ goes, hey, man, we're all going to Coog's Cafe. And my stomach went, Arr. <laughs> But I noticed that there were these two hot Asian girls that I'd never met before. So I said, yeah, I'd love to go to Coog's Cafe, man. <laughs> so, uh, so we go to Coog's Cafe, and I, I actually got to sit next to the two hot Asian girls. One of them was named Valerie, and she was from New York, which was hot. And uh, <laughs> one of them was named Dixie, and she was from California, which was even hotter. Um, and uh, I was like, I was so stoked, you know, and, and Valerie looked over halfway, and she said, hey, you know, next weekend we're going to go, uh, we're going to go dancing. You should come with us. And I was like, I, I can't dance at all. But yes, I'll go, of course. Uh, and then a little while later, you know, we all get up and we're all leaving. And, and Dixie actually, she hands me this, uh, this little candy wrapper. Um, it was a little Jolly Rancher wrapper made of tinfoil. And I, I, I looked at it and I said, oh, come on, I, I'm not going to take your trash. And she said, no, no, look at it. And I looked closely and it was a tiny, she had folded her candy wrapper into a tiny little origami crane. And I was like, I almost threw that away. <laughs> and, uh, and so here I was, like, I, you know, an hour before, I had no friends, and I was miserable and full of food, and now I had a dozen friends, and I was going dancing the next weekend, and a girl had given me a piece of artwork made out of a candy wrapper. So I was like, college is awesome. <laughs> um, and I did go dancing. I did the white boy dance, you know. <laughs> like this, kind of. It was really, really embarrassing. And, um, uh, but we all did, we became really fast friends, the three of us, me and Dixie and Valerie. And we hung out together, and we were really great friends for about six months. Uh, and then the second semester of college rolled around my freshman year, and um, uh, I, I remember having this conversation one time with Dixie. I said, you know, I think Valerie is going to break up with her boyfriend back in New York, and uh, I, really, I really like Valerie. And Dixie said, well, you know, it's really not a good idea to date, like, friends, you know, it's just, it's a bad idea. And I was like, yeah, but I really like her. Uh, and I said, you know, I, what I didn't say, actually, at the time was because, you know, I, I'm probably never going to get you to break up with your boyfriend back in California. Uh, but that's what I was thinking. Uh, but anyway, so uh, <laughs> against, against uh, professional advice, um, we did start dating. So Valerie and I started dating, uh, and um, it was exactly as predicted, a, a total disaster. She immediately took on the role of like the jealous girlfriend, and I immediately took on the role of the subservient boyfriend. Uh, you know, I, would, I, like, I wasn't allowed to see any of our mutual friends, including Dixie, and um, she, would send, she would get mad and like send me out for ice cream at two in the morning when everything was closed. Uh, and um, it, was really, it was really bad. It was like, you can't even say that I was whipped because, you know, like, Actually, she was a very devout Catholic girl, and for the entire three years that we dated, we actually never had sex. So it was like a whole new level of wit, you know? It was like <laughs> beyond anything you could imagine. And so, um, <laughs> so uh, 
this went on. It went on all the way until our senior year. And, and our senior year uh, in college, uh, I, 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 I was like, you know, I really miss my friends, and I have to do something about this. And I finally, uh, during one of our many arguments, uh, I said, look, that's it. I don't, I don't think we should see each other. And I hung up the phone. Yeah, I, I broke up with her over the phone. I know, it's bad. Um, and she immediately destroyed everything that I had left in her dorm room over the past three years, including my 13-inch uh, Panasonic TV VCR combo, which I really loved, by the way. Uh, but anyway, um, I did get to see my friends again, and, and my friends kind of welcomed me back, and uh, they said, you know, we really liked you and Valerie before you started dating. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and in the meantime, Dixie had actually broken up with her California boyfriend, and, and her entire small circle of male friends, uh, there was great rejoicing. Um, and, and actually, so one night, uh, Dixie and I went to a party, and um, the party kind of uh, wound down, and, and we found ourselves walking. Uh, we used to have great conversations, walk all over campus, and uh, we, shared a, a little, um, we shared a little Debbie uh, coffee cake, and she gave me a hug, and I told her, I love you. And she told me the same thing, and uh, in some form or another, either married or uh, engaged or dating or friends with benefits. We've basically been together ever since then. Uh, now, not, not a lot of things actually last for 20 years, um, but apparently uh, little cranes made out of candy wrappers are one of them. <laughs> yeah, I still have it. Uh, and uh, every once in a while I get it out and I look at it um, and it reminds me how lucky I am that I didn't throw it away. Thanks. <laughs> Next up, Moth Grand Slam champion, John Grady. I worked as a, um, a janitor at my university at the, in the student union, and one of the perks was is that I got to go to all the little uh, student activity shows that they had there. Not that they weren't free, but I went to them anyway. Um, they would have, um, you know, it would be like you know, comedians for night or people, singer, songwriters, or you know, something else, some sort of um, act. Uh, then this night uh, in particular, uh, there was uh, a, a, like three, Really bad comedians, and uh, and and a bad guitar player, and then this uh, magician, this magician or, or illusionist or something, and 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 there was it was really horrible, to, or horrible to the point, you know, where after the uh, the. Uh, uh, comedians and then the singer songwriter that um, you know people were sort of on the edge of their seats like I just want to get back to the dorm this is, this is bad this is just no this is no good and out comes the um, the magician and uh, and he's a large fellow he's he's large like um, like kind of Chris Farley large you know maybe like uh, less hair like like me and uh, uh, before he starts, he, they hand out all these um, uh, cards and envelopes for everyone to, to fill out. And on it, you are supposed to put your name and uh, your birth date and then a question. There may have been something else, like maybe your favorite food or pet's name or something like that. But, but I, remember, I remember it's like writing my name and then writing you know, uh, my birth date. And then I wrote this question and then you put it in this envelope. And then at the last minute I was like, nah, that's not, oh, I don't really want to know the answer to that question. No, 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 no. It wasn't very personal, so I took it out and I was like, and I just scratched it all out, and I put it back in the envelope. Now, in the envelope, there was uh, there were small, small envelopes, and it had a, a piece of tin foil in it. And I thought, oh, that's well, maybe that's so you can't see through it. I don't know, for, you know, I don't know what that was for. But then everyone put them in the basket, and he does. He starts doing some tricks, doing some card tricks, and um, and they're you know, card tricks are like you know. That's, I don't know how you do that. That's, that's amazing. I, I can't do that, but that's, you know. Um, he starts then, uh, he turns to start taking this basket of cards, and he says, I'm going to just sort of read these, and he takes them out and holds them in his hand and starts spinning it in his hand and calls a woman's name, and she stands up. We're all immediately like, well, she knows him. This is all fake. This is all set up. This is completely, you know, like for me, it's like, you know, I don't, unless the ghost is taking a thing and moving it across my room going, Rrr, you know, like, I don't believe it. It's just not, I don't believe it. So, but then another woman and another woman, and he takes up another card and he, doesn't read, and he, reads, and he puts it on his forehead, starts spinning it on his forehead, and he just starts reading these people, saying their names, what their question was, and when they were born. Again, now everyone in the room is like, what is going on in here? 
we have been through all these bad comedians, this bad singer-songwriter, and now this weird thing is happening. And he says, let's get a man this time. He's like, I mean, just a, it's going to be a guy in here, a guy, a guy, uh, John Grady. And I stand up, and now everyone's giving me that look like, oh, he's connected with him. He's like, and he starts, and now I notice he's, he's sweating profusely. Like, I, I mean, he's just like, he looks like he's just working so hard. And he's just like, he's just like spinning it on his forehead. And he's just going, and he starts, yes, Ferris, circle, Ferris wheel. Fer you want to know how much money you're going to make on the Wheel of Fortune? This question that I had written, I mean, I had scrawled it so tiny because there was just no more room left on the card at all. And he, I went, yeah, and he went, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's in the thousands, it's in the thousands, just, um, just come talk to me afterwards. <laughs> the whole place, every, now it's closed, at the end of the night, and they're closing it up, you know, uh, and they're closing up, stacking the chairs, and, and I had this kind of like odd Willy Wonka moment where I'm walking up to him, and I'm like, um, excuse me, sir, as he's packing everything up, I'm like, I'm the guy from the Wheel of Fortune, I'm gonna go try out for the show this week, which is why I wrote that question. He went, oh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, thousands. Um, but you're going to have to work really hard. Two days later, I'm trying out for the show. And I get in the room, and the room is like, there's like 80 people in the room, and they pass out this, uh, this questionnaire, and there's like 20 um, half-filled problems, you know, from the show with consonants and vowels, and they're like, ready, go. And I'm like, I'm like, title, person, Phrase, time, fuck, what, what? And they collect them all, send 70 people home, they keep 10, and I'm like, what? How did, ah, oh, I didn't work hard enough. Now I'm gonna go back home and I'm gonna drive my roommates insane because I'm gonna be watching the show every day. I'm gonna have them giving me puzzles every day because I'm gonna get back there and I'm gonna work and I'm gonna get those thousands, I'm gonna get those thousands because he said it's gonna be a lot of work. And then I, and then I thought, maybe, Maybe the work is me getting past myself and this idea of work. You know, like when you're sitting there and you're watching the game at home and you're like, boom, every answer. What? How'd you get boom, every answer? Because it comes to you so easy. You're just kind of open and relaxed and you're just... There, it, it, maybe it looks like work, but it isn't. You know, it's, maybe it's this. Maybe it's this thing. You know what he's doing? Where you know he's just you're open to the ideas, and they just come to you, and it's just the information flows through you, and you be, you become this vesicle or this vehicle for the answer. Or maybe it's just a trick. <laughs> Thanks, guys. And finally, me, Kevin McGee. I learned secondhand in college that sometimes that someone that you think is a your greatest enemy can come to your aid sometimes when you need it the most. So I joined the theater department at the University of Florida in the early 90s. I was in my early 20s, and uh, I was very excited, and I really liked it. In the department, there were a number of professors, as you would assume, um, don't know why I went down that avenue of that sentence, but uh, within that, there was a woman who I'm going to call Helga, which is not her name. Helga was the voice teacher. Uh, she was a young, uh, vivacious, she was about 37 at the time, and she was so hot, and she was just giggly and fun, and all the guys had huge crushes on her, and I, uh, I was one of them. And uh, the head of the department was a woman named Judith Williams, and Judith Williams was very prim, proper, very uh, buttoned up, and those two women butted heads all the time. And because Judith Williams was the head of the department, she always won, but Helga always had a big problem with her. At one point, Helga was trying to get tenure, and she thought that Judith Williams was trying to keep her away from this, so she was going to work extra hard to get this tenure. At the time, I was sometimes doing odd jobs for professors, just anything I could to make money, typing up things, looking after their apartments if they were gone, just anything odd job-wise. So she asked me to come out to her place, which was about half an hour outside of Gainesville, this secluded little ranch house that she had rented for her time there, and come out there and just take all of her dictation and type it in. I arrived on a Saturday morning, uh, I was 23, she was 37, and 
she was very sad that day because she had recently broken up with her boyfriend who was living with her in this house. And the whole day while we were trying to work, she was having trouble keeping it together because everything reminded her of Shane. She apologized profusely. I'm sorry. It's just I'm thinking about Shane. I had no idea what to do. So trying to be cutesy, I started playing a game with her, which was everything in her house also reminded me of Shane, and it really upset me as well. (laughs) And she found this incredibly funny and incredibly charming, and the next thing I knew, we were outside in her secluded home making out by my car. (laughs) Thus began what would ultimately be a year and a half relationship with her, but for the first six months, it was a secret, and no one could know it, and it was exciting, and it was fun, and she was so much older. This was the first woman I had been with, no more games. I learned there was a whole new level of things to deal with, and um, it was uh, just the, one of my, uh, my favorite uh, youthful relationships, and it was just, uh, just fantastic, uh, but we had to keep it a secret. Now, Shane still held a torch for her, but an angry torch of I still run your life torch, and he started calling her and trying to find out, so who are you dating? Oh, no one. Really? I think you are dating. I, I've seen you with a guy. Who is that? That's, uh, that's not a guy. It's a handyman who comes out and does odd jobs for me. <laughs> Therefore, my nickname between the two of them was Handyman. So one day, he wanted to find out who ha- the handyman was. So he drove out to her house with the key that he still possessed. While we were gone, he went through her house, tore it apart, finding things. And when we got home... All of the pictures of me that had been in the house were on top of the stove, set on fire, just a pile of ash and one kind of reminiscent of something of my face right on top. (laughs) She freaked out. She called him, and he was upset, and he goes, I know who he is. He's a student. You're going to get it. So what he does is he goes to the head of the theater department, and he tells them that One of your teachers is dating a student, and his name is Patrick McGeehan. Get him. So then, about a day or so later, Heather is called into Judith. Helga is called into Judith Williams' office. And at the time, these two women are rivals, and Helga did not get her tenure. And she was already moving on to another school. She was going to go teach in Colorado. So it didn't matter anymore. And she went into Helga's office. And Helga said, I want you to sit down. Um, I know this is your last bit of time here. Uh, but there's been a complaint. Something went, someone went to the dean. And it has come to, over my desk that you were dating a student. So if you can look me in the eye and tell me that you are not dating Patrick McGeehan then I will believe you, and you can go. And then there was an understanding, and, okay, I'm not dating Patrick McGeehan. Judith Williams gives her a nod and says, okay, then I think we're okay. You can go. So then Helga leaves. She comes to me, runs, and tells me the story, and in my 23-year-old bravado, I say, I'm going to go beat Shane's ass. Which ultimately did not happen. But our relationship continued into the summer, and a little bit after I moved to Chicago, she moved to Colorado, and it was a great relationship. And like I said, I learned secondhand that sometimes the person you think is your greatest enemy can come to your aid when you need it. That's it. That's our show. Special thanks to our storytellers, Josh Willis and John Grady. Also thanks to Josh Callahan, Mark Orzeka, The Second City Hollywood, and the Comedy Podcast Network for producing the show. If you would ever like to see the live show, Funny Because It's True is every other Tuesday at 10 p.m. at The Second City Hollywood, located on beautiful and mildly scary Hollywood Boulevard. You can like Funny Because It's True on Facebook to find out upcoming show dates and themes. 
All the past episodes are available for free download on the Comedy Podcast Network and iTunes. While on iTunes, feel free to leave a rating and a comment about the show. The more comments help the show grow to a broader audience on iTunes. Plus, it appeases my staunch desire for attention, approval, and acceptance. The next live show is Tuesday, May 22nd at 10 p.m., and the theme will be Uncomfortable Situations. So come out, put your name in contention, and maybe you'll get chosen to tell a true story on stage, and from there, get chosen to be on the podcast. My name is Kevin McGeehan. Thanks for listening. You have received this transmission from the Comedy Podcast Network. For more shows, visit ComedyPodcastNetwork.com.